Good evening and welcome to Hardfire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and I'm here with you for another half hour of current events and political discussion from a libertarian perspective. My three guests tonight are Brian Jones, consulting actuary, Nick Leobold of the Manhattan Libertarian Party, and Bob Cotton of the Hudson Libertarian Party, Hudson Valley Libertarian Party. And we are going to discuss tonight the uh, implications of a uh, free market economy, um, pre presumably as opposed to the not quite free market economy that we have today. Um, Bob Cotton, I'm going to start with you. Um, for those of our audience who are not quite sure, maybe you can give them a quick rundown of just what is meant by a free market economy, by uh, free banking, free brokerage. <clears throat> Well, a free market economy depends on voluntary exchange between individuals. Uh, something of value is given by party A to party B, and something else of value is given by party B to party A if both parties feel that they're better off with this exchange. Uh, and do we have a free economy in the United States right now? Well, uh, it turns out to be a relative term. And relative to most other countries in the world, uh, yes, uh, it's more free than most, but it's not as free as it used to be. It's certainly not as free as it could be. And uh, I think uh, we suffer from some of the same problems that unfree economies have suffered from through history. Such as what? Well, <clears throat> as more uh, functions are taken over by government, uh, or for example, our own federal government, money, pensions through Social Security, schools, medical care. Most recently, it, these things that are taken over by government are socialized in some way, and they become a source of endless problems. The problems require endless and increasing regulation that never goes away, and yet there is a drumbeat for ever more regulation, ever more socialization of new areas of the economy. Okay, and uh, Nick Leobold, you are concerned with a uh specific part of the uh, concept of the free market economy, that is to say, free currency. Can you tell us a little bit about um, um, your idea of what sort of a currency system we ought to have in this country? Well, as a libertarian, obviously, I want a totally free market across the board. But in terms of money, uh, in terms of currency, uh, nas the national monies, I am a lib also a Liberty Dollar associate, and libertydollar.org is an uh, uh, organization which produces a private alternative free market currency, such as these um, Liberty Dollar silver pieces. And um, basically, this is a, a private uh, currency like we used to have many of uh, in past centuries. And um, it's backed by gold and silver. And it also adjusts for inflation, so it protects people because instead of being, um, instead of having paper money, which is no longer backed by gold and silver like the United States dollar used to be, you know, you can you can ha you can use these silver liberty money, and if if inflation goes up and it accelerates, um, the value of your money will also uh, go up uh, in proportion, and so you'll be protected. And so also, this ha will have a lot of benefits for our country because the Federal Reserve system that we have now is really controlled by a cartel of international bankers. And uh, they, they always wanted a Federal Reserve system because it allows them to manipulate and profit from, you know, uh, inflation. And really, so they make billions and trillions of dollars. And meanwhile, the American people are robbed of their work and their savings. And, it, it, you know, a fiat money encourages uh, waste and encourages um, spending money. And... Uh, a strong silver, uh, gold, or commodity-backed currency encourages saving and investment and um, people to own what they produce. And okay. Brian Jones, what do you have to say about that? Do you agree with what Nick has just said? Well, I, I have no problem with Nick. I'm not going to stop him putting these things into circulation. I'm certainly not going to put him in jail for doing that. But I think we ought to recognize what those things are. They are warehouse receipts, or the, <coughs> the pieces of paper that are represented by silver or by gold are, sim are simply warehouse receipts. I'm all in favor of having them circulate in the economy as commodities. 
Gold is traded as a commodity. Silver is traded as a commodity, and that's just fine. But I think we need money to provide a store of value. And fiat money, I think, is the only way to do that. Gold-backed currencies, silver-backed currencies have all failed in the past, and I think they will fail in the future. Is that so, uh, Brian, um, Bob, that ha have um, gold and silver-backed currencies <clears throat> failed in, um, in our history? To some extent, I agree with Brian. I think there was some failure in the uh, 19th century, and the failure was of this kind, that uh, gold in particular uh, started to become scarce towards the end of the 19th century, and its price rose, which meant that the price of everything else fell since other prices were based on the price of gold. And this led to unhappiness in certain circles. For example, employers, uh, in the face of deflation, have to decrease wages. That's a very unpopular thing to have to do. The unions hate it, for sure. And uh, to have an inflation-neutral currency would be a very valuable thing. And it's not clear that at this point in history, uh, gold could meet that need. OK. Uh, Nick, what I'm curious about is um, why is it important that um, this money be backed by gold or silver? I mean, why could it not be backed by raisins, for example, or books well, of matches? I think the word is fungible. I think raisins or maybe, um, uh, well, raisins spoil, and it's hard to carry a lot of them. And, and certainly, uh, I mean, silver and gold are very convenient. Actually, because raisins don't spoil. They keep forever. <laughs> they get kind yeah, of dry. Yeah, but, but, your, but, your, but your coin purse gets sticky and gooey from the raisins. That's and, true. and gold and silver are very con the most convenient form of uh, portable money to use. Uh, but I'd like to respond e to several. Except perhaps for paper. I'd like to respond, well, you know, but then, you see, you, you commented that um, gold and silver backed currencies have failed. Uh, perhaps gold and silver backed currencies have failed sometimes in history. However, fiat paper backed currencies not backed by any valuable commodity have always failed and have failed without fail. I mean, every single paper currency in history up until the present has failed eventually. And that's going to happen again to the dollar, and it is happening. The value of the dollar is uh, diminishing as we speak, and it's diminished about 30% just in the past five years. Well, now, uh, is there no such thing as commodity-backed paper money? Well, that's what this is. I mean, silver and gold are a commodity, and it's been and 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 uh, that w that it, it, silver and gold have been found to be the best commodity to back money. Okay, but I don't want to schlep around a big sack full of gold or silver coins. I would just as soon have something a little more portable well, like paper. Well, we, you know, I mean, um, uh, Bob brought these Sacagawea United States um, dollar coins, and, and I mean, we, you know, Liberty Dollar has paper certificates also that you can carry around instead of coins, but the difference between a Sacagawea dollar here and a Liberty Dollar here is that this is made out of um, base worthless metal, which is really not worth anything, and uh, this can inflate away. I mean, this silver is actually a valuable commodity, and it will protect you if the value of if the if the um, if the if the inflation goes up. Well, now, Brian that, Jones, maybe that, you can explain to me why mm -hmm. silver, for example, is more valuable than um, tin or um, pig iron or whatever. Well, because for the moment there is less of it, but the the notion that silver is necessarily a store of value that will last more or less indefinitely, that you can rely on its inflation proof, etc. It's simply not true. If there is a big silver strike tomorrow and huge amounts are being mined, then the value of these things just, just falls. They're subject, they're subject if there's a strike, to... If there's a strike, the value would increase, not that's, fall. That, so are you telling me that the... No, no, uh, that the I, I, I don't mean the strike... I, I, I mean a discovery. Oh. If, oh. If, if silver is discovered in large quantities. Okay. Are you, <coughs> ask, are you telling me, though, that the rarity of a substance uh, is always directly proportional to its value or vice versa? No, but I would certainly say that the rarity of both silver and gold has an awful lot to do with the fact that they began to function as money. Okay. I'd, yes. I'd like to uh, bring in a new thought due to Hayek, basically. Hayek, uh, I think... I agree with Nick that uh, fiat money is worse than gold. I had to speak against gold just now, but I certainly agree with you on that. And uh, the, the reason uh, is 
that in order to regulate fiat money, the government finds it necessary to monkey with the interest rate, which no other form of government that's exchangeable for something of value has to do. And this has terrible consequences for the economy. It leads to boom and bust constantly. And uh, just the fact that the government can pay interest on money uh, that you say invest in a government bond and there's no risk whatever because they'll destroy the economy before they refuse to pay that interest and yet that bond is now competing with stocks in the stock market where there's risk being taken and companies are going out of business just because the Federal Reserve has to raise the interest rate this is terrible and it's much worse than what practically any other kind of money well, would it's, do. It's really, it, a, it's really a monopoly and if the American people really understood the Federal Reserve system and how they're being robbed there would be a revolution overnight because literally the, uh, the American people have become slaves to the international cartel bankers who control the Federal Reserve and they're being fleeced every day that they work, every day that they pay taxes, which, which was the tax, the income tax was passed, uh, you know, shortly after the Federal Reserve system was formed and that's Actually, why it was passed. Uh, I believe it was the income tax was passed shortly before the Federal Reserve System was formed. I think it was after, yeah. but no, I it think was it was just, the, no, the think uh, was income tax was passed before. under Taft, think, and then the Federal was, Reserve was established under Wilson. I think it was the opposite, but we can look that Very up. Very short. But I, I, th I think we're, we're running away from the fact that when you have commodity receipts, the commodity is going to fluctuate in the market. If, there, if, if gold is discovered, you know, if right next to South Africa we have another rand and gold comes pouring out, then the notion that gold is a stable, solid form of value. Well, now let me is, ask it, you about just, gold. Just it's, been, it's been considered a highly valuable material for many, many years. Thousands and, of years. Yes, of course, thousands yes. of years. And I can't imagine that it's only due to the rarity of gold. Is there some intrinsic well, value in the well, stuff? I, th I, th I think it is. And you, and you can see that uh, if, if you look at the 1500s, <clears throat> when the financial system was flooded with gold that uh, Spain went and stole from uh, the South American cultures and British privateers stole some of that on the way over, mm -hmm. that flooded into Europe and it produced great inflation. Yeah, and I don't and, understand And, and this. it couldn't be controlled by I don't by understand government. this at all because, for example, I've got quite a lot of blood in my body. I've got about 10 pints of blood in my body, and that's useful stuff. You can take that out of my body and give it to somebody who has suffered severe blood loss, and that will cause them to recover. Now, there's relatively little earwax in my body, and you can't do a damn thing with it. It's valueless. Well, so, you, you, you're right that the, the use of gold as money and the fact that it functioned as a store of value reasonably well is really rather arbitrary. It's a convention that people agreed upon amongst themselves. And when it fails to function as it did in the 1500s, and it would do again if there were a significant amount of gold discovered, that shows that it is not ideally performing that function. Well, I'd like to answer that because, first of all, Joseph, when you, when you attempted to pay me in earwax, that's what our, our relationship really took a nosedive. <laughs> but um, there is enough precious metal to, to back a currency. It's just that you don't have to back it completely in gold. You can back it in silver and gold. And our currency in the United States was traditionally backed not only by gold but by silver. And so there is enough silver to back a currency worldwide. Uh, we could have a gold and silver-backed currency like the Liberty Dollar or even a government currency uh, in, um, in, uh, along with private currencies if we had a free market. The government currency could be backed by silver and gold and so could private currencies. But when the gold I'm, I'm is... Yes, the I'm concerned that we have two libertarians here trying to dictate what kind of currency we'll have. It seems to me that what libertarians should be doing is pointing out which laws sh should be removed for the public benefit. And it seems to me some of those laws involve banking and brokerage. If brokerage laws were lifted so that you could call your broker and say, I want you to shift 10 shares of General Motors stock to Brian, you could pay Brian in stock. The liquidity of well, the can't that be done now? I don't think so. Oh, yes, it can. Knowledge. I've done it on, well, on, uh, on, a, on a number of occasions. Yeah, it seems to me that you can do that. I've, I've certainly heard of stock being used as a gift or shares being transferred. Oh. Mm -hmm. But I'm not. I'm not trying to suggest that I'm that I'm putting uh, limits on the free market. We don't have a free market. I'd love to have a free market, and I'd love not to have these regulations at all. 
And I'm not suggesting that we, we should have regulations. All I'm saying is that we don't need to have uh, regulations, and we can have a, a currency that is backed by value, by, by value rather than by, by air. There I'm, but Would the, there be but some the way to uh, backing by value re really bothers me. The, the notion that silver and gold well, it bothers it, me too a little or, bit because I immutably set as stores of value. It, doesn't does have, you know, it bothers me a little if, bit if, because I wonder how you would reduce various commodities to a common value in such a way that uh, people could intelligently exchange either these commodities or various currencies. It bothers me more that there is no bank that has both assets and liabilities and is willing to exchange one for the other by giving gold for certificates the way they would do with gold certificates. The Federal Reserve sets up the liabilities, the greenbacks, but it has no assets that it's willing to exchange them but, for. This, but, is a, this is broken accounting. Right, I'm not suggesting that you can't have a wheat-based currency. And if you want to, I encourage you to go right ahead and do that. And just don't interfere with my right to go to my local store and, and voluntarily trade with my local merchant with my Liberty Dollars. I, if he I have no them. problem at all if he, if he takes them. That's fine with me. That's I'm not going to put you in jail actually for take doing these? It. I mean, if I wanted Absolutely. to buy a can of soda pop, could I take one of those Liberty Dollars to the deli and be pretty sure that the, uh, the fellow behind the counter would accept them? I use my Liberty Dollars all the time. They're a valuable commodity that is pr uh, protects you against inflation. I use them at Subway Sandwiches, Home Depot, any, anywhere that the merchant will voluntarily accept them, I use them. And uh, it's all voluntary. It's not, force is not, is not involved in this. Um, uh, if, if a merchant doesn't want to take them, he can refuse and you can pay with something else. It's as simple as that. Okay. That's no different from saying if I have a grapefruit, I can walk into the baker and say, I'd like one of those rolls, and you will, you, will you, you take bring, my grapefruit? You can bring a dozen Fine. eggs from your chickens, yeah, and you can trade okay. for, uh, for five loaves of bread if you want. And, and, and any merchant in the city is totally free to, to do his business in barter, if he chooses, rather than in accepting uh, uh, any kind of currency. And also, um, the legal tender law does not mean that you have to use or you have to accept um, U.S. Federal Reserve dollars. All it means is that if there's a debt, that you must accept Federal Reserve notes for that debt. But it doesn't mean that merchants or consumers are forced to only use U.S. dollars. Absolutely the contrary. Everyone is, uh, all adults, but, but anyone is, is free to barter with whatever they want. But you're shooting at a straw man. No, nobody is arguing that. Nobody is saying that there is anything wrong with you putting out these Liberty dollars, going out and spending them, using them to get whatever, whatever you want, just fine. Now let that, me make that sure that I understand that's a because piece I'm of a broader economy. Of these matters. Um, um, when, when we say that um, the U U.S. greenback is legal tender for all debts, public and private, that's just basically saying that you can accept anything else you might want in payment of debt, but you cannot refuse a greenback if it's offered to you as payment of that's debt. Exactly. That's, that's, that's correct. correct. Okay. To go back to what you said, that you can transfer stock, that could be true, but I know that in my uh, online Schwab account or something, there is no provision for sending Brian stock. There's provision for buying it, selling it, and that's it. Now, I'm sure that I could get a certificate and sign, over, sign it over to Brian. Mm -hmm. I, I have no doubt about that. Sure. But I think there are restrictions, and there certainly are the tax restrictions of capital gains and so on that would make it very difficult. Oh, it's a tax event. To use, it's that. a tax so event. So yeah. they make it very difficult to use any kind of security like that as money because of the, all the tax events that would well, be involved. Libertarians want to, as you do, we want to eliminate taxes. And that's a, I mean, if, you know, you can't just look at this point by point. It's a whole uh, oppressive system which, which works together to stifle everything. And people would be so much more prosperous if we get, get rid of regulation, get rid of all the taxes, get rid of all the oversight and accountants and everything, and just be able to trade freely and uh, have property rights, because our property rights have been obliterated. Uh, are, you know. So let me ask you this, well, one, Nick. Would, one you, way, uh, would you be in favor of a system under which people could refuse greenbacks if they wished? Absolutely. That, that's the whole essence of libertarianism is you're free to trade for what you want, uh, you know, you're free to enter into a contract or an agreement if you want or refuse to. Okay, now, uh, Brian, I imagine that you think that uh, we would suffer pretty negative consequences if we were allowed to refuse greenbacks for the payment of debts, correct? Yeah, I think one of the better things that we have done with our economy, which is basically a barter system, that's what an economy is all about, 
<coughs> we have inserted into it the idea of money, and that is a store of value. It's a way of accumulating funds. It's a, it's a way of deferring gratification and investing. And I can take $5,000 that I've saved up, invest it, and draw interest on it. Just, just the way I can take a sack of potatoes that I don't want to plant myself, give it to somebody else, and say, go ahead and plant these, and when, and when you get the new crop, I want back a sack and a half or a sack and a quarter. Okay. That's exactly the same kind of thing that's going on in an interest transaction. Uh -huh. now, um, I'm deferring gratification and getting rewarded for it. I have to say it. something about this because the whole, I mean, you can do that with, with commodity-backed currencies. There's no problem with that. It's just there's mathematical ways to do that. But the real thing is that because we have a fiat paper currency, that's why we constantly are getting ourselves into wars and constantly the welfare state and the regulation state are expanding because a fiat paper backed currency that's worth nothing allows the government to just inflate away all the things it wants to pay for and the American people are left holding the bag. Okay, now well, Bob Cotton, oh, maybe good. you could tell me in practical terms what it would mean to our economy if people were allowed to refuse greenbacks as payment of debts. Well, in practice, I think to make a real change, you not only have to change monetary policy, but fiscal policy, and make it much more difficult for the federal government to go as far into debt as it does currently, and much more difficult for it to charge the uh, taxpayers any rate of interest that might be necessary to control inflation and to pay interest on this huge debt. At some point, we may find ourselves unable to pay the interest on the huge debt that we have simply because of inflation. We have to keep the interest rate above the rate of inflation, and that as we've seen in around 1980, can go up to near 20 percent. That's a, a very dangerous situation, which does not occur with any currency that's backed by goods of any kind. It doesn't have to but, be commodities necessarily. The existence of, na of, of a national debt has nothing to do with the existence of paper currency, it has fiat a, currency. It has, it it's, has very, it's tied to it because of the interest problem. It's, it's necessary to control our currency that the interest rate must exceed the rate of inflation. The national debt makes this a much more serious matter because there's so much uh, principle to pay interest on. Uh -huh. Now, Brian, no, that, that, I would like to ask you something, Brian. If um, can, can I just respond to one thing that was said sure. earlier uh, very quickly? And that's this notion that somehow if we get back to gold and silver backing, war and all these nasty things is going to go away. I seem to remember, well, I don't remember, but I, I know that in the 1500s, oh, Spain, you're old. Spain was awash with gold. <laughs> The idea of fiat currency never crossed their mind, and they of still course, and they were involved in wars all I the think time. And they still but, sent but the let armada. Me, let me ask think, you this, um, Brian. Um, uh, Bob was talking about uh, how the government has to set the interest rate at a certain level in order to um, um, keep the economy more or less under control. Um, what do you think the consequences would be if interest rates could be set any old how by anybody who had money to lend? Well, they already can well, be, Joseph. It's just it, it operates in the in the free in the um, private segment of the market. Interest rates are set privately all the time. There's even a website now called I think called Prosper.com where people can actually lend out their money to other people. It's called social lending, and mm -hmm. that's an uh, that's a growing uh, trend where people can lend out and borrow money uh, based on the interest rates that, they bid but on. That but is, many states that, that have what they call usury laws, which limit the, um, but, the, the ceiling on But uh, that's not rates, usury. Correct? That's not exactly usury because people are allowed to agree or not on what interest rate they're bidding on. So it's, it's all voluntary. Yeah, but this is all done in U.S. currency, so... Okay. You know, all, but, uh, all, 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 all that we're What I'm wondering is, is that the, every couple of months, every three months or so, the... Uh, um, chairman of the Fed comes on TV and um, reveals to us what the um, um, interest rate is going to be, whether it's going to go up yeah. or down. Uh, what if that went away? What if that stopped happening? Uh, what then, would the consequences be in real terms for our economy? Well, I think it can't go away without the whole notion of a national fiat currency going away with it. And what, what is happening when the Federal Reserve sets those interest rates? It's trying, and I think over the last few years it's made, made a pretty good job of it. It's trying to maintain the money as a, as a solid, stable store of value, as something that you can accumulate and invest and Brian, draw, draw I interest. Believe, I can't believe what I'm hearing. You're, you're calling the U.S. dollar a solid, stable 
valuable store well, of wealth. I would have to agree with, have to agree value with Nick over on this point, because uh, if, if that's so, then how come it takes uh, $500,000 now to buy the same groceries that you paid $100,000 for in 1960? Well, I'd, uh, I'd, yeah, I'd, 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 I'd look at the things from two different points of view. First, first of all, internally, I would argue that over the last few years, the Federal Reserve has been doing a pretty respectable job of maintaining the currency as a store of value. So the... Uh, it's lost very, 30% of very, its very, value just very, in the past five years. Very recent... Well, uh, we, we've had internal commodity inflation, but that's been relatively well controlled. And the, the, last, the last few years with the internal deficits that we, that we Prices have... Prices are going been up... A, They've Normal people who have to live and buy milk and buy uh, gas and buy and pay rent every day of their lives, they they are seeing the prices go up. The prices are uh, skyrocketing. Well, now, fiat in, money. Bob, but maybe you but, can but, explain but this to me. Don't, you've don't, you've don't all, the prices of certain items rise and f uh, others fall? Uh, so that inflation doesn't necessarily cover every item you buy. When you say that no, measuring the inflation, CPI is up 6%, that doesn't mean that every item you buy goes up 6%, no, does it? Measuring inflation is a delicate matter. I, I suspect probably wages would be a good way to do that rather than goods. Mm -hmm. But I, th I cannot agree, what, I agree with my two friends here, that fiat money is by no means a store of value. It simulates something that might be a store of value by using this hocus pocus of an interest rate adjustment. If, if, it's, if it's well maintained, and again I repeat, over the last few years I think a pretty respectable job has been done. I think a lot of people would disagree with you on that. Internally, it is functioning as a store of value. I, th I, th I think when, when, when we talk about the dollar losing its value, we're really talk, talking about two different okay. things. The interaction... At this oh, point, me, though, I'm afraid I have to cut you off because uh, we've come to the end of our time. But I want to thank all three of you for uh, making very interesting a topic that most people would consider terribly dry. Brian Jones, Nick Leobold, Bob Cotton, thank you, all three of you. I'm Joseph Dobrian. Join us next time for another edition of Hardfire.